is an audio sleep for dive H1962. UTC time is 003615. Mark. Control van uh, deck, that's all stop, five zero meters. Good copy. And then are you uh, good to fire a die of salvo at this point?
No, that's the spare one. Right. The old Argus. Michael, are we good to fire dive salvo? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Let us know when it's good to start SPO. I put the wrong depth on the board. It's actually 2436, I think. Not 2600. Roger, I got the I got the right one off the dive plan anyway. Yeah, see if you can get that to twenty eight. Twenty-eight. That'll be about a hundred minutes, ninety minutes, hour and a half. Right yep, at the end of our like watch. <laughs> yep, just in time to <laughs> give it to somebody else. Twenty-eight hundred is quite the depth, though. Twenty-four hundred. Oh, 2, okay. <laughs> twenty-four hundred. How's that say that? Twenty-eight meters per minute. Got it. Got it. It's okay. We just enjoy the beautiful water. Um, can we get Atalanticam panned down a little bit, if able? Sure. Get that? Oh, Sarah's not on SPL. Oh, all good. Flick your SPL or doogery things. Uh, Atalanticam <laughs> down, please. Just a wee bit. Are we settled? Still need some time? No, we're all good up here. Okay. Okay, great. So, everybody who is tuning in, welcome aboard the exploration vessel Nautilus. We are currently diving to about 2,400 feet. And in un I believe this is a geo that we are right outside the Pacific Rim Islands Marine National Monument, which is 50 miles north of the Cameron Reef. And we are looking to explore the edge of a large flat top seamount. And so you can come with us on this journey by posing questions live via our website, and we'll be here to answer them. So I am your SPL host for this watch. My name is Daniel. We can go around and do some of our introductions. My name is Sarah, and I'm the scientist. Uh, my name is Dwight Coleman. I'm the watch leader and uh, geologist. I am Loopy. I am the data logger for this expedition. Um, I'm Cheyenne. I'm the navigator. What's that? Oh. I think so. Sir, I think you're not you don't like them? on <laughs> SPL or maybe I just not can't hear talking. You. you gotta push down on it. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Who's messing with my stuff? There I am go. Sarah, <laughs> the Atalanta pilot. <laughs> uh, Michael, the Herc pilot. And last and but not least. <laughs> I'm Amber, the video engineer. Ooh, 12 to 4. So I covertly wait for you guys all to do it so that I can look at your audio levels. <laughs> <laughs> so, Perfect. Yeah, it works Safe well. Safe on a 4. So the, for those of you who tune into our last watch and wonder why our camera was so fuzzy, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it was because we had a smudge on it. Well, but we're was it a smudge? It was condensation. No, it was Con condensation. Yeah. So we got led astray because both cameras, the mini, the Zeus on the Atalanta was dirty, hmm. but it was like both at the same time. So I kind of made a reckless assumption. Mm -hmm. Ah, I see. And assume that they were both 
wiped with the same dirty cloth, but it was condensation, so we've got the spare on. Yep. Yep, so we should have a clear dive today. Indeed. That would suck for 20 hours. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's a good go thing yesterday was short. The other thing with yesterday, too, was it was a priority for the dive bot as well. So yes. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. that. So Enjoy. we're about an hour and a half from the bottom. Cool. Thanks, Diane. Um, Michael, real quick, is the still cam powered on? No, I don't think. Hold on. Nope. Uh, now it is. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. Seeing some little stuff as we go through the water column. We're currently in the... Uh, uh, I can't quite see the... Yeah, we're currently in the mesopelagic zone, just past the, um, we're just at about 285 meters, so we're about 85 meters past the photic zone, so things are starting to get a bit darker, which we can't tell from the live stream because we have lights on, but, um, yeah, sunlight does not penetrate, well, begins to penetrate less at Wheel. these depths. What was that? I was just saying that sunlight is less at these depths. Mm -hmm. We we're past the past the prime zone. No. That was the epipelagic, correct? And epipelagic is the photic zone, correct? Yeah. They're the same thing. Two and different words. We should be entering the mesopelagic, correct? Mm-hmm. All right. Yep. And then we will be in the bathypelagic. Mm-hmm. Between 1,000 and 4,000 meters below the ocean surface. Yep. But soon we'll be entering a zone that's outside of time and space and <laughs> the laws of man. We will be entering <laughs> the twilight zone or the mesopelagic zone. <laughs> It's like one of the few old TV shows that I'm actually really into. It's a good one. Yeah, I feel like I, I kind of watched like an episode or two, but I got bored, but I feel like I should retry it. It's definitely worth it. And in some parts of the ocean, the ocean goes even deeper. And we have other zones, including the abyssal zone, the abyssal pelagic, and the hadal zone which is down deep in trenches, like the Marianas that's Trench. Fine, that's fine, 28 is fine. Jelly! Oh, and it's gone. In fact, some of the deepest parts of our ocean can contain the entirety of Mount Everest within it and still have room spare. So that's how deep the ocean can get. But in these parts, we're going to find depths at maybe around 4,000 meters, but we'll be diving to a little shallower today than that, about 2,400 meters. I want to say hi to Kaylin and Ollie again. <laughs> Yay. That's your sister and dog? My sister and my aunt's dog. Okay. Yeah, she's watching, uh, Kaylin's watching Ollie in Colorado mm. um, Why my aunt's on a scuba diving trip. Whoa, that's cool. That's awesome. Well, tell her, tell her to buckle in because we have another hour and like 25 minutes. <laughs> yep, super exciting. Yeah, tell them to tune in and ask us any cool questions. Yeah, this is a great time for questions. Yeah, like if uh, Cheyenne has been giving us any problems out here, not, no, mm. she's been okay. 
But to say that was this one time. That's easy no, for you to <laughs> say now. <laughs> oh. Hmm. What uh, was that? Are those fish? Oh, a siphonophore. Mm -hmm. Or it could have been, I don't know, it could have been a tinophore with really long, weird tentacles, but I don't think so. Oh, and that on Atalanticam is some sort of fish that just went by. Actually, you can try and do it. So we have some questions coming in. Mm -hmm. So oh. normally I put that there, but it's fine. So for the deck crew out there, do they ever uh, experience like heat stroke standing there waiting for to launch? Actually, the temperature outside is in the upper 80s, but it's actually fairly reasonable given that there is a constant wind chill that kind of brings it down. So uh, it's nice to stand out there and not feel the feeling like you're in sweltering heat. Granted, the sun's still beaming down on you. Yeah, it was pretty hot out there just now. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're pretty close to the equator, so the temperature stays pretty consistent, and so does humidity. But there is a nice little breeze when we're in transit. Yep. And it's also close to the first day of summer to summer equinox, so mm, sun's also oh really high in the sky as well. That's so true. I forgot about that. Summer solstice, not equinox. So for those of you who are at home who may be trying to answer a question but doesn't say that our team is available. I did save it so that it says that we are available. We might try and refresh the page. But we have been getting questions coming in the past few minutes, so should be open. So Dwight, I have a question for you. Yes, Daniel? Do you know much about mm -hmm. the, oh. oh wow, it's a big long spot for. Mm -hmm. It's kind of floating there. Yeah. So. A new one and everything. Do you know much about oh, the weather in this portion of the world this time of year? Would it be considered, say, a typhoon or hurricane I do season? If I let them grow, I do it too, and then I get really annoyed that I did that. Like yeah, good messy. question. Um, we're, we're so equatorial right now, I'm not, Mm -hmm. too sure. Uh, usually in the tropics, no, yeah. in the northern hemisphere this time of year, you're getting into the rainy season. Um, you know, we're sort of out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, though, and subject to the trade winds, mostly. Mm -hmm. And they're pretty consistent, as we've seen. Yeah. And uh, uh, I think the, the fact that we're seeing these uh, frequent squalls come through is an indication of the season a little bit. I don't think those are um, all year all year round necessarily. Although uh, we could ask uh, Chris that question, who spent a lot of time out on Palmyra Island, Palmyra Atoll. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I would say summer season is sort of their wet, wetter, rainier season. But yeah, I know for um, this time of year. At the uh, national park I work at, it's their monsoon season, so they're getting quite a bit of uh, rain every day, and that can be a danger to hikers out there. So, if you're ever traveling to national parks or going outdoors, make sure you check the weather ahead of time. If you're going to the outdoors, like any place outdoor, I'd say yeah, anywhere. <laughs> Always check the weather. Really hoping the weather is nice when we get back to port. 
but from what I've heard, Cheyenne, I guess you can corroborate this, but from what I've heard, it's either like a mist all day or like spurts of downpour in Hawaii. Is that uh, kind it, of it or it no? It depends on where you are because uh, because of the mountains, they'll be like isolated weather systems, but the rain usually clears up pretty quickly, so. Um, hmm. And it's always the same. It's like, it's always the same temperature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which we're noticing here as well. Also, the sun sets at like the same time. So. Uh, That's really nice. Yeah, in elementary school, I lived in Hawaii and the sun always set at like seven. And that was just like when the sun set and then i moved to virginia and like during the winter it says at like four and i was like what is this <laughs> it's like what do you mean there's like 16 hours of night i know in the winter it's very disconcerting get out of swim practice and it's completely dark like <laughs> that is something i never thought about it's uh just the different latitudes that you're at and different times sunsets are mm -hmm. yeah yeah, I've definitely gotten used to being super dark early in the winter time on the east coast where I live at. So that's why summer is always nice. You get mm -hmm. a lot more time in a day. So a lot of you have probably been looking at our feed and seeing many things floating by. <clears throat> a lot of that is uh, a lot of colonial organisms floating by, like siphonophores and jellies. Yeah, they're hydrozoans. As we get, deep, get deeper, we'll start to see less and less of those. We'll also see a few shrimp dancing in our cameras. Mm -hmm. Shrimp or krill? Oh, good question. <laughs> or copepods. Good question. If only it looks could krill, you know? Uh... <laughs> So yeah, so another question we have, how far does our ROVs dive? So they are rated to dive at a max depth of 4,000 meters. That is what in Hercules and Atlanta are, I believe. But we also have another ROV called Little Hercules, which is rated to about 6,000 meters. New drawing of the day. Is that your d drawing, drawing of the day? Of the day, yeah. It's a beach. Nice. <laughs> Palm trees, sun. Yeah. <laughs> Even got Fish. a sandcastle. Some uh. corals. <laughs> Here's a question. Do we see more stuff in the water column at night or during the day? Well, yes to both. Um, it depends where you're talking about in the water column. Do you mean do you mean any specific place or just compared to like the sea floor? No, just like when we're going up and down. Um where we usually see the most stuff. So during the day in the water column the sun is really bright, so a lot of the organisms migrate downwards to avoid that really bright sun and also predation because they're more visible in the sunlight. And then when it comes close, closer to night, they migrate upwards because, um, you know, because of all the phytoplankton that are up there, there's more food and it's not bright. And that's called diurnal vertical migration. Um, but generally, yeah, generally it depends on the time of the day. I know um, on one of the watches, I think it was like sunset or something, they said that there was a very clear <laughs> like layer of just jelly organisms that they came across and it was like sunset. So they were in the, in the process of migrating upwards. Um, so that's cool, but yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. 
That's great. Ooh. Huh. Ah. <laughs> a Tina Four. <laughs> that one's really cool. That one had like. It was like a cone. Yeah, it had like symmetry. It looked like a birthday hat. Yeah, it, it did. did. Yeah. It did. And it looked like it had like four flaps at the bottom. That was cool. Um, for those at home, if you don't know what a Tina Four is, they are a type of jelly. They're not the same as like jellyfish, I guess. Like Scyphozoans, Hydrozoans, they're not Cnidarians. They're a different phylum. Um, they're more basal as well. Like they're older in um, evolutionary history, but they they have jet propulsion and they have tentacles. Um, but yeah, a little different. <gasps> Speaking of, I brought my iPad today so I can be extra factual. Whipping out your lab notes there, lecture notes. Oh yeah, <laughs> I had a really great professor for invertebrate biology. So, So I got an interesting question coming from the chat. What's mm -hmm. the protocol if we find an unknown shipwreck? Do we have to report it or identify it? Like, what's the, uh, do we know of any procedures that we have to do? Uh, I'm sure we would try our best to document it, but there's, it could be hazardous to get too close to if it's in an unknown shipwreck. It depends how modern it is and what kind of condition it's in, but you'd have to really uh, be careful around it because it could have rigging and lines and sails or whatever. Uh, but I think we would probably do our best to try to identify it. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, we have some contacts uh, who are archaeologists. And yeah. uh, we would probably get in touch with them and uh, send pictures and uh, just do our best to kind of communicate what we found. Mm -hmm. But um, no special procedures. Uh, we would probably notify the monument because they would have some, perhaps some kind of jurisdiction over it. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. If it's a military ship, it would be uh, technically still owned by the, whichever Navy, or whichever country's Navy it came from. That's one of the laws. So what if, say, we're also down here and we might discover say um like another submarine or underwater mines like <laughs> has that ever happened or is there any like procedure or protocol for finding those if we run into it uh generally stay away <laughs> yeah i think we would probably call someone who knew more and would give us instruction i'm assuming grant i'm sure the chances are pretty slim given how oh, one yeah. we're exploring uncharted ocean and two. Oh, we've seen uh, depth charges down on the bottom. We've seen uh, unexploded ordnance before. Yep. Really we're cool. not really near any yeah. battle sites yeah. or Navy bases right now, so uh, that would be kind of rare here. But we work up uh, around Hawaii and obviously Pearl Harbor is right there and there's all mm -hmm. sorts of remnants of World War II off the coast of Oahu. Mm-hmm. So there are like efforts to um, kind of de-arm what's at the uh, on the sea floor to in case there's unexploded ordnance that could still pose a danger. It depends on the nature of it. I think there's not too much effort that I know about other than um, documenting it well. Uh, but it, some some of this stuff is um, and potentially dangerous to the environment, like. There's a place, I think, off Southern California where they found a dumping ground of mustard gas cylinders, and Ooh. that's, like, bad, right? So um, the government is probably taking strides to figure out how to deal with that, right? 
but um, you know, a ship like the Nautilus and the ROV like Hercules isn't equipped to really handle anything like that. Mm -hmm. It would probably be uh, it's an, another it's an type outsourcing. Of company. Yeah. Above our pay grade. <laughs> But yeah, there's there's a uh, you know trash and dangerous uh, items all over the world's oceans, and uh, it's a problem. A lot of the shipwrecks uh, have oil and gasoline still yeah. fuel, you know, fuel oil still inside them. Yeah. So I was thinking about. Um, I'm not sure if we've done any expeditions to like um, islands or atolls before that were like once um, like hazardous sites that are looking to be surveyed, like say some of the old Navy bases or even nuclear test sites if they're okay to survey. Is that something oh, yeah. that uh, people have done before or Nautilus has done? A little bit. Um, there's been talk of going to Bikini Atoll, where there's a lot of, uh, you know, they did the uh, atomic bomb testing there. Mm -hmm. And there's uh, sunken shipwrecks there, too. Um, it's been documented before by others. Um, there's plenty of battle sites that have been well studied by technology like this with underwater archaeologists and historians. Um, we've done quite a bit. Uh, one of the first cruises ever of Nautilus, NA001, back in 2008, was uh, looking at the Battle of Gallipoli in the Mediterranean Sea, in the uh, Dardanelles Strait off Turkey. And we uh, did dives with Argus only, looking at um, well, probably half a dozen or more, maybe ten, as many as ten different uh, shipwrecks that sank during that battle. World War One. Wow. Yes, the first World War. Yep. And um, we did document a few uh, military ships and aircraft, actually, up in the Black Sea. Um, Then lots of ancient shipwrecks were found off the coast of Turkey and Greece in the early days of Nautilus, too, that we documented. We found a couple commercial ships, fishing boats, a sailboat. Mm -hmm. We found a sailboat with its sails still up, sitting on the bottom. That was pretty wild. We're about an hour from the bottom wonder where those yachts are that those orcas sank mm -hmm. recently. <laughs> Wait, orcas yeah. sank yachts? There, w There's a group of orcas off the coast of, I think, like Spain or some coast of Europe that like one of them just started being really violent towards like yachts. And wow. then it taught some other orcas to also be violent towards yachts. And I think they sunk like a few. Wow. wow, we need to remake Jaws. Yeah. <laughs> I think orcas are much better. <laughs> the orcas strike back. Yeah, yeah, they were like budding. They were like ramming into the yachts and they like sunk a few. But it's only like one group of orcas that are just really angry. Wow. Or I guess they think it's fun, but... It's payback um, for SeaWorld. I don't know, maybe they're being territorial. <laughs> I don't... They don't... I don't think they know why. I think one of them just like learned it and then like <coughs> taught it to others. But I wonder what the update is with that. Yeah. Orcas it is interesting. Are, orcas are mean. <laughs> but they're also smart too. <laughs> yeah. That's scary. That's a scary combination. They sunk three yachts. True, people are a scary combination of being intelligent and mean. So I don't blame them. Truth. <laughs> Three. Off yeah. in the in the Atlantic or in the Mediterranean? Uh, 
uh, off the coast of Spain in the Strait of Gibraltar. Wow. Interesting. Did they sink it by tipping them over? No. It says, um, <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> it says they would strike, so they would ram into the yachts. They would. Um, hold on, sorry. Okay, so incident number one. They rammed into the yacht and pierced the rudder. A uh, little one shook the rudder at the back while the big one repeatedly backed up and rammed the ship with full <laughs> force from the side. Jeez. Oh my gosh. Um, and then the little ones were like, I want to do that. So they started to ram into the boat, into the, the ship. And I think that's just what they've been doing. Were there passengers on board? Or just I'm sure. like crew or um, it had to be somebody. Okay. Yeah, they rescued the crew and towed the boat. Okay, so it didn't sink, but it was oh, okay. damaged. At least one of them. <laughs> Sounds like the start of a horror movie. <laughs> yeah. Instead of Jaws, it's Orca. Mm -hmm. But, like, not a high-budget horror movie, like a very low-budget... Instead of Sharknado, it's Orcanado. I don't know. They just had Cocaine Bear, which was based on a true story, so this could, oh, you that's, know. that's true. They suspect that one female Orca experienced a traumatic event, and then that's what led to the uptick. Revenge. Mm -hmm. I feel like people don't think that animals could be vindictive like that. Look, some animals are real smart. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know orcas went into the Gibraltar Strait area. That's interesting. Me neither. However, to Jaws, sharks are not smart enough to hold a grudge. <laughs> sharks are not one of those animals. True. But yeah, animal intelligence is uh, something that's I done my own research on, not like actual research, but just curious. <laughs> and it's very interesting because when you learn about how intelligence has evolved in different creatures across the animal kingdom, you're also seeing how it's manifested itself in ways that's you know appropriate to its environment, but also to survival. So say with humans, our intelligence evolved to be very communal because we best survived in communities and we really got close to caring for our own because in turn that also was our brains growing as well where it takes a lot of effort to raise children like some animals babies come out and they're ready to walk and go out into the world but for us it takes 18 years to get one kid out the door <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's like even if it's at 18 so if. and many other animals they also ex exhibit this kind of behavior like elephants um they kind of have similar life stands to humans and when they brought out the cinnamon toast <laughs> crunch <laughs> it was like swarmed okay I, so people are pretty serious about that i've seen people smuggling it out of <laughs> I, dry stores I and have like seen okay that. Uh, and i don't i think they're bringing it back and forth and like hiding it right. so other people can't get it oh man yeah yeah it should be an easy thing to just stock up on it doesn't go bad well they they leave the pantry unlocked no cheese. Oh, that's, that's the first. So that's, that's the, the first. Issue. You sure you wanted to tell your secret like that? I have not been in there. Excuse you. I'm a good noodle. <laughs> You're just asking for it. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I've I've been slowly concerned about the snack stores for like a hot minute. I'm like, all right, when's the day that we're just not gonna have popcorn anymore? Well, I mean, we're almost about a week and a half out. Let's listen to yourself. A week and a half out. 
Oh. Hey, that's that's <laughs> not too bad. We'll be back in port by then. Yeah, but. Yeah, that's not that soon. Can't run out of things yet. I was gonna say, <laughs> it's getting hard. I think the avocados it's really are hard. long gone. It seems like, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. probably. And, they and the been. regular lettuce. The bananas came out on like day three or something, and I just <laughs> and laugh it at it. I'm like bananas. Went straight <laughs> to banana Lives. bread. Yeah. Which is delicious. Oh, but it was so good. I wanted it so bad. Someone told me about it, and I went up, and it was gone. No. People were like, oh, I had three or four pieces. I'm like, oh. oh. <laughs> no, there was like quite a right few there. people who didn't didn't get that. No. Special oh, treat. Sorry. I no. Yeah. I try to be cautious about how much I take, but hey. <laughs> first come, first serve. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, you'd be, you'd be considerate, and then there's raccoons going around. <laughs> 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 yeah. Smuggling everything, squirreling yeah. stuff away. And Grubby little, little paws. Crunch caches all over oh, the man. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I really miss, I miss the hummus and the artichoke dip that they had for oh maybe yeah. three days. Why mm. can't we have hummus the oh whole right. time? Oh, right. Yeah, I, I forgot about that. They no probably bought like three containers so and they were like, all right, guys, that's it. You're yeah. right. Like they should be doing those dips, hummus and the, the eggplant stuff or stop. whatever. And the, and just the, the, the root veggies and peppers. Like, all oh, my God, stop, food. please. Like yes. a good like yes. carrot with dip. Yeah. Oh, but why can't we have that? I know for like forever. our little our little <laughs> snack time. Right. I thought about that. That's and remiss. I was like, they should do that. We get we holes. get sugar for snack time, but I yeah. want my little carrots. Right, my here little carrot sticks. I don't want the sugar stuff. Mm -hmm. But hey, maybe we can petition. I don't think we'll get a big following. So we want carrots. <laughs> There's going to be a mutiny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> get these people off the ship. More sensible <laughs> crunch. <laughs> That's, uh, they must be like, I don't know. Get them to hold up for a minute, see what happens. I don't want that to get too exaggerated. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, just stop now. You can kind of see the wire in wire cam. <laughs> Looks all right. <laughs> the wire is fine. It's not. It's not bad. I just don't want it to get. Yeah. It's fine now. I guess all those cabinet resets pulled us off quite a ways, huh? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm try we're trying to creep back. Yeah. We're halfway back. Yeah. That's fine. And we're, we're still on the slope, so it's not like we're landing in a large sandy patch. I don't know if it's going to be a sandy slope, but... Probably not. It's sort of steep. Yeah. It's steepish. Probably. This is, yeah, mid-slope. It might be uh, rocky. Mm -hmm. You know what's happening, though? It's fine anyway. It's a... Uh, I was struggling a little bit with the, all the cabinet outages. I kept calling forward backwards, trying to keep us relatively in the same place and be ready. Yeah, so who said that in the meeting? That's uh, Brian, I think. Uh, we could have a l language of like soft stop. Like when we say mm -hmm. stop, they don't need to stop hard. Nine times out of 10, we don't care. They can soft stop, like right, right now. Yeah. There's no need of that. They can just drift to a stop. Yeah, we should get our jargon right for what that. What we yeah, mean like by I, that. Yeah. I don't know that we've ever done that. Like when we're uh, when we're on the bottom and we say stop, we want to stop hard usually. But mm -hmm. right. But for there's lots of ex times like this when yeah, you don't need to be trying to. Yeah, go back the other way. Oh no, yeah. yeah. So we're about half an hour from the bottom, guys. Almost there. So we're going to place bets on what we are going to see once we get to the bottom. Sand, rocks, sponge city again. <laughs> My guess is rocks without too many things on them, because we're a little deep for that, but could be surprised. 
So to say carbonate rocks or just, you know, uh, basalts? No, probably the, yeah, manganese coated basalts that we've been seeing. But we did pick this dive to be on the east side of the seamount, uh, which should be better for the current direction and <coughs> bringing nutrients to the animals living here. So here's a question from the chat. What are some misconceptions the public has about our role on the ship or about a profession in general? Wait, what was the question? What are some misconceptions? Yeah, about that the public may have about our role in the ship or about our profession in general. Um, I don't know. It's, you know, the, the crew, the way we staff the scientists on this ship is uh, a mix of, of professional contractors who sort of do this all the time and spend a lot of time at sea and versus um, scientists and students who are at a university somewhere and actually spend the majority of their time in the lab or classroom, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in some cases, this is sort of a volunteer opportunity for participants. Um, uh, you know, we have a lot of special guests, uh, people that come along that, who are observers. Um, so, I think some of the misconceptions may be that, you know, we're all, you know, full-time explorers doing this all the time. You know, we, most of us have jobs elsewhere. Mm -hmm. I think another one might be there's a lot of uh, younger people, which I was surprised about. Yeah. Especially on the science team. Yeah, yeah that's the thing. Like, I think for many people, is a misconception is you have to be, like, uh, like a postdoc PhD student or a tenure professor or must have been like this hardened Navy sailor to come out here and do all this exploration but we have a quite a diverse pool of people uh, old and young like early career or late profession who mm -hmm. are aboard the ship to help us with this exploration and the thing about our vessel is that it's a learning vessel so we try and have people from all walks of life and all ex um, levels of expertise come on so we can all learn from each other and if you yourself are interested in being aboard our ship and learning something great you can go to our website we have opportunities for employment or to join our team via internships or fellowships you could see that on the about tab under employment opportunities or you can click join and we generally have applications for our ocean science and engineering internships that open up in the fall as well as science communication fellowship this is okay. open to this is open to scientists engineers videographers um formal and informal teachers as well as artists and videographers And another misconception is that many people think that uh, the ROVs um, have people on them, like in subs, but they are not full of people. They are full of ro robot parts. Uh, <laughs> they are uh, remotely operated vehicles that dive down the ocean for us. And, and taking away the human factor, we're able to do dives more efficiently and more routinely. But there is a trade-off to having an ROV down there versus an actual person down their ocean looking at things. I can think of a, a couple of disappointed children's faces over the years, <laughs> toddler age, and they can barely get it, and they think that you're going down, and I'm going down in a submarine, and then when it occurs, to them, when they when it clicks, and it's like they just get it. And so you don't, you're not in the, <laughs> no. No, <laughs> no, it's like a video game, and then, oh, oh, 
<laughs> they're so not impressed. Just, yeah. oh, that's stupid. <laughs> I can do that. Yeah, many people I've told about what I'm doing, they're like, oh, you're actually going down underwater? And I'm like, no. 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 <laughs> but it's still cool, though. It is very cool. It but is. Yeah. But yeah. Cooler. Yeah. I mean, we're in a metal box with no windows. We could pretend <laughs> we're in the water. <laughs> oh, this is this is awesome. But to a, to a child who's like, you go under the water to the bottom of the ocean? No, no, no. <laughs> oh, just watch it on TV. Like we, we send do. our avatar down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, then they'll get it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But then no wonder, you mean the last airbender or the blue people? Uh -huh. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so, somebody wrote in and said, be thankful you're not an archaeologist or a paleontologist. And be asked, what's the last dinosaur you discovered was all the time? <laughs> <laughs> Which, I don't know, sometimes it could be fun, but it's also like the same it can be the same question yeah. where you have to find different ways of making it interesting when people ask, and that can be a chore. But I do think it's interesting that we have people coming in asking about what it is we do and what's our favorite kind of fish or what do we do when we're not on watch. Like That's kind of how you get to know people, even just by the basic questions. Yeah, we found a couple fossils already, so we are amateur paleontologists out here. <laughs> yep. Yeah, we found uh, whale bones, and they I believe they're a part of the skull of the whales, right? That's our working hypothesis. What's that other bone, though, that's in the lab? That's a, I think it's might be the same thing or something different. I'm not sure. Yeah, they, it, was, it was like two whale bones, I believe, that they said they discovered. I, was, I saw something else. Maybe a, oh. maybe, uh, yeah, a maybe it was like a sponge stalk. Oh, it could have been. Oh, what the the long thing? Yeah, that, yeah. that was that was a sponge stalk. Oh, really? Yep. It was hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like fossilized. A little um, bit. Or was it just dead? Just. Was it black atroph at all? Atrophied. I mean. <laughs> They can um, be pretty hard yeah, if they're yeah. made of um, calcium carbonate. Yeah, that's what it was then. I didn't see the sponge that we brought in. Was it? Oh, I didn't see it either. Was it massive? Like we like thought it was when we put it in the box. I mean, or was I didn't it see like it. relatively, it was hmm. huge from yeah, but I didn't see it either. I was sleeping. Me too. Well, you guys managed okay with the foggy camera, huh? Um, sort of. That's you yeah. can put it that way. No, yeah, it was terrible. I, I, <laughs> was it? Not well, easy. Well, I, I, I missed the other camera was dirty too. It was dirty, so yeah. I, I called it dirt. It wasn't dirt, right? It was fog. Obviously, we know yeah. now. So that, but I don't think it wasn't getting more condensation. We would have noticed, right, if it was. Yep. Taken on yeah, condensation. It, and it was a dive bot dive, so it was like, okay, I think it was yeah. right. But it was painful. Like It was hard. Yeah. I got off and I, and I was like, why am I so tired? It wasn't like a difficult dive. Yeah, and it was just straining. looking at all the other cameras, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It was exhausting. Yeah, and you had a full four. I was, yeah, I was balancing the still cam with IDs, with. Yeah. But hey, we made Did it. Did it happen slowly? once we got to the bottom like on the previous watch well, or was it already so the thing is like i've been checking this one because you can't we, you couldn't see it yeah. on the zeus just looking out in the water like that you have to look at something like this yeah and then it showed up like loud it was like whoa whoa mm -hmm. yeah. um and then but um sarah had noticed right as atlanta was going off the deck that the the uh that mini zeus was dirty yeah. And but then at that point like Herc was in the water. Yeah. Kind of said, "Okay, let's go with it." So, made an assumption that they and were both and dirty. They didn't really know until they got to the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> until I was like, "Wow, the water clarity here is really bad." <laughs> I kind of saw like streaks and striations, but I was like, "Maybe it's a glare." 
or something. Oh, but so yeah, all over this. it came out to be really obvious when we stopped to do the white balance. We're like, yeah, oh that my was gosh. Real, <laughs> that was. Yeah. Well, at the at the beginning, the computers were flickering too. Oh my uh, god! So don't we, bring that up again. Right so we had, so we had that um, kind of distraction as we were going down. Yep, good times. But uh, we're all fixed now. Hopefully. Yeah, I didn't make it. I watched for about a half an hour after we <laughs> launched, and uh, <laughs> since Le Lila was here with you guys. I checked out. Yeah, it wasn't. C glad I didn't really miss anything. <laughs> well, we saw a batfish, but we couldn't really see it. Cause yeah, I think we scared it away as I was yeah. trying to get down there to mm -hmm. image it. But we still saw it briefly. Mm -hmm. We saw some hard corals, which was fun. And I know the, the watch after us, they said that they saw some really huge, huge fans. Ooh. So... I wonder what I wonder what those pictures are gonna look like. Mm -hmm. We got some good laser data. Mm-hmm. That yeah. too, yeah. Lasered a lot of coral. Yeah, which I guess was like the main thing, right? Because they yeah. have like right. one more dive on the table, maybe something right, like that. Exactly. I think. Yeah. So, I think it was. I think it was overall productive. Yeah, I think your watch. They were very productive. They probably got a little tired uh, on the second one on the um, yeah four to eight because I think they were kind of done. Yeah. They woke me up at 6.30 and like, it's time, we, we need to recover now. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't surprised. Oh, hey. almost four, which I didn't realize. So we're about 15, 20 minutes to the bottom. Oh, so close. By the way. <laughs> so that will be the next watch, but for her viewers at home, we're almost there. So close, yet so far. Just this is random, but I'm just thinking about how I I could be in Mallorca right now. But I'm, instead, I'm watching Blue Water, which is much more much more unique experience. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I was supposed to go to the Aslo conference. Did you say Mallorca? Where's mm -hmm. that? Uh, Mallorca, Spain. Oh, it's like an island off Spain, and that's where the conference is this year. But shout out to anyone who's watching from there if you're watching. Yeah. <laughs> what kind Live it of up conference? for me. Um, it's the um, American. Hold on. That's not even. It's not American. <laughs> it's Association for the Sciences of Limnology and Oceanography. A S L O. So a whole bunch of people. Big conference. Is was it a conference where you could get like sponsored travel? Yeah, so I was accepted as part of um, a certain program. Oh gosh, let me see if I can fig find out what the program is called. But basically, it's like a DEI endeavor, and also because I participated in an in an NSFRU. Um, so basically, it's uh, since you had a research project on your belt, they. Uh, gave you opportunity to go to a conference and present it? Yep. I applied and the and I got it. Um, yeah. 
I don't know where that email is, unfortunately, but yeah, it's a certain, um, oh, yes, the multicultural program <coughs> is what it's called. Sounds interesting. But yeah, if anyone is a student listening and you have cool research and you want to present it um, at a certain conference, definitely check out their websites, see if they have programs, because they will pay for you to go. Um, and present. They'll pay for your like travel, your um, abstract fee, everything if they have those programs. So yeah, highly recommend. And we have people tuning in from all around the world. So far, nobody from Spain, but we have had people from tuning in from there. In fact, one of our uh, people aboard who's working with the laser dive bot is Spanish, so mm. shout out to Pablo. Mm -hmm. We also have people from all over the world in Russia, Taiwan, New Zealand, Hong Kong, Greece, Colombia, Egypt, oh. Jamaica, United Kingdom, the U.S. and Canada. Okay, Egypt. We love our MENA countries. Um, yeah, it's 4 o'clock in the morning in Spain, so that probably explains it. <laughs> Just letting you know the fancy H two O. Oh, I looked down for two minutes and it went up two. Okay, good try. So we have a question coming in that asks: Are there any crystals in gold down here? So that's a good question. Uh, Brian, do you think you know if uh, there's any of that kind of mineralogy down here? <clears throat> Not at this specific spot we're looking, no. I wouldn't expect much. Um, we'll have to wait till Coralie gets here to talk about, like, <clears throat> crystals, as I think the most people would say. The, some of the basalts have a crystalline pattern to them, mm -hmm. or the gabbros that were formed um, more slowly can have a crystalline pattern, but like a quartz crystal, I don't think so, um, but that's I'll have to confirm with Coralie when she comes in at watch change. Um, but no, I wouldn't expect to see a lot of um, precious metals yeah, like change. gold or stuff here. But you do see those um, around hydrothermal vents and systems and stuff, which aren't found here, but certainly other parts of the deep sea. Speaking of, Coralie just got here. Yep. <laughs> so it'll be watch change in the van here. We'll probably be off comms for just a couple minutes. Yep. And your new SPL host will be Katie for the four to eight watch. Y'all have fun with her. So see you all later. Yeah, they just have four meters left.
Good afternoon, everybody. We have just finished switching over our watch and we are getting ready. And as y'all guys who are at home can see, we are descending down. We are actually on the same uh, little mountain, the little summit on top of the geo that we dove on earlier. And yeah, hopefully all the cameras are cleaned off. They look pretty awesome. But the same thing is if we can go around and everybody say their name, what their role is, and for the question, what is your unsung job that you do on the boat? The one that you feel like you do it, but you don't think anybody notices it? Or the one that you're like, oh, this is super important. So I'll go first. My name is Katie Doyle. I'm a, a lead science communication fellow. And I feel like the unsung role is probably doing all the photo highlights and the capture pings to make uh, the photo albums at the end of the cruise. Uh, hi, my name is Corley Rodriguez. I'm a graduate student at the University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography. I'm a geologist. Um, I don't think this is like unsung or anything. This is just something new that I've been doing, but um, I've started learning to do deck work, which has been super fun um, because it was something that was always like kind of enigmatic to me, but I really enjoy doing that. I think that's a really good one because, yeah, so many times it's like you are putting in extra hours to go out there. You're giving up sleep to go be out on deck. Much appreciated. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm Brian Kennedy. I'm a deep sea benthic ecologist with uh, Boston University and the Ocean Discovery League. Um, and my unsung role on this trip is I make sure all the breakfast croissants get eaten by the end of the day. So long as it's not the breakfast pizzas, we're okay. I'm a huge fan of breakfast pizzas after lunch. And we have Loopy. Yeah, hi, I'm Loopy, um, a undergrad at Tuskegee University, um, typically on the tour of the four watch. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I don't think I've really done anything for real here. Um, well, you do all the paperwork. Yeah, I, oh, I feel like yeah. you do a lot. Um, well, my team, I would say my team, we do a lot of um, making sure all the um, lab photos and capture photos, vid caps are in. Um, we do the dive reports and everything. After the sample each dive, logs. The sample logs. Mm -hmm. So yeah. You process all the samples. We're like behind the scenes of everything. Of like the paperwork I would say after processing. <laughs> <laughs> Which is critical because none of none of the scientists would be on shore would ever be able to make heads or tails of the samples without all those that documentation. So yeah. it is one hundred percent critical. Hundred percent. Thanks, Loopy. Can we throw it down to the first row? Daryl, can you tell us who you are, your role, and what is your unsung hero job? Hello, my name is Daryl Talak. I'm the video in engineer intern. Um, I'm a MTSU undergraduate, Middle Tennessee State University undergraduate. I currently work on my live video production degree. Uh, one of the things I do is I clean the cameras on the uh, around the ship uh, above the water. So pretty much all the cameras that you see when we're like on the deck of the ship. Rand, do you have a moment to answer the question? If not, that's okay. Oh yeah, uh, I'm Ren. I'm sitting in the Atalanta chair tonight. Uh, I'm not so sure I have any unsung roles on the vessel. I feel like I've gotten most of the work I do is pretty n noticed. I feel like that's extremely untrue. I feel like, um, cause so many times uh, you get recognized for sitting and piloting the vehicle, but then there's so much that y'all guys do outside of the normal hours 
like when I'm able to take a nap, you're still out there working on the Hercules, still working on Atalanta. Uh, I appreciate that viewpoint. <laughs> Definitely is noticed. So thank you for all that extra work that you're putting in. So Coralie, we asked this question on our blue water dive this morning, but you weren't here for it. Mm -hmm. So I got to throw the question back to you. What is the coolest thing that you have seen on a blue water dive? Brian so far has, of course, taken the cake with, I saw a whale shark. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. I saw a Dumbo octopus once. Was that on our, no, it was we didn't on see the Dumbo. Last, last Kingman and Palmyra cruise last so season. So cool. So, so cool. Loopy, what about you? Because you weren't here for this morning's conversation either. Um, I, the most that we've seen on our blue water dives is just like uh, squids and then the oceanic sharks. We just see like a bunch of them. Um, the other day, we seen like a group of like three of them. So that was like pretty cool. Yeah, that was awesome. And I know Brian said he saw a tuna and we tried to look for it in the, not the still cam, but the capture pings that we get. Could not find it, not day, not doubting it wasn't there, but I was so upset that it wasn't, like I could not get a good image of it. Yeah. Sometimes like you see cool things in the camera, but they swim by so fast before you can like snap a photo of it. Right, right. I feel like it was that way with that tuna. Brian goes, tuna, and then it wasn't there. And oh look, we're on the bottom. We're so close. That was some great blue water. And yes, for those listening at home, breakfast pizza is absolutely the best. Thank you to the 12 to 4 watch for doing all the blue water and yes. dropping us right on the bottom. Oh, <laughs> we appreciate so that. You're yeah. so welcome. <laughs> <laughs> we should be close now. Yeah, we can yeah. see the bottom. Yeah, we just see saw it. So we're uh, right about there. I feel like this is a question for Brian. Brian, how deep can see sea turtles go? Can they go into like the deep sea? I know. <laughs> I wish there was a close up on your face right then because that was, that was amazing. I don't know off the top of my head. Um, they I know. are, they are uh, ectotherms. So they, they can't um, usually go down too deep. They but can't then go I was down like, maybe too deep, but long, um, leatherback sea turtles That's are That's the one huge. I was thinking of. Yeah. Um, and so they're from that ancient lineage. And they have some what's the term, gigantism thermal reserve or something like that that allows them wow. to work in much colder water just because they're so massive, they kind of generate their own heat even though they're technically ectothermic. Oh, man. Um, okay, so it says approximately 4,000 feet. Oh, wow. And that is coming from NOAA. So NOAA says 4,000 feet. Now i got to translate that over to meters. It's like 1,300, 1,200, something like that. That is so impressive that you know that off the top of your head. Uh, 101 meters. So definitely not in the deep sea, but still uh, deep. No, you got it. Something's wrong. What? 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 Oh, it's on inches. Yeah. <laughs> like, that nah, doesn't work. <laughs> okay. Put. Oh, yeah. You were, like, you were dead on the money. 1,200. 1,200 meters. But it looks like most turtles stay in the top 200 to 300 meters, leatherbacks being the exception. I've only seen one leatherback once, and it was very, very brief. Like its head popped over above the water, and we were, and 
there were three marine biologists all saw it at the same time. And we all looked at each other and we just went, was that what I thought it was? <laughs> and had three of us not seen it and all immediately agreed on the ID, I'm sure none of us would have believed it was what it was. Wow. Um, that is on my bucket list. I have gone, like, a, when I was in Panama, you could go out at night with the, the turtle experts, and then you would, like, walk up and down the beach trying to find them nesting on the shore. Never found one. Oh, that's too bad. It's really cool. Yes. I am I really, really, really want to. Uh, I know Chris has done work with the leatherbacks and finding their nesting sites and keeping an eye on them. I've done work with loggerheads. Um, and it's really amazing when they're actually laying their eggs. They are go into a trance-like state, and they are completely oblivious to the world around them. You can walk up to them, measure them, take their blood, whatever, and once they start laying their eggs, they're completely oblivious, and you can do any kind of scientific measurement to them, um, which also makes them exceedingly vulnerable while mm -hmm. they're in that state. Um, but that was... A w an interesting experience when you just walk up to one and like pit tag it and, and take a whole bunch of um, measurements for it uh, and they just don't care. And then as long as you're gone by the time they're done laying, they just bury the eggs and go back out and, like nothing happened. That's incredible to me. So I've gotten to help out a little bit with Kemp's Ridley sea turtles because um, Padre Island National Seashore is like the big home to them after, what is it, Nuevo Hacienda in Mexico. So a real story of an animal that was almost on the brink of extinction and then thanks to human intervention just kind of like came back. So if y'all guys get a chance, the Kim Fridley sea turtle is a really interesting one. And if you go down to Corpus in the summertime, you can actually watch the baby hatchlings. They do it at six o'clock in the morning. They do a public announcement and you can show up on the beach, and they're very strict with the rules, of course, but you watch them as the little babies start to migrate to the sea. So do you know, because I, I saw, um, it was like a TikTok or so, of like saying that I think if like, the um, turtle lays covers her like lays her eggs like in a more warmer. Yes, hundred percent. It'd be like males, or mm -hmm. is that for females, and then d vice versa. Yeah. So the gender is determined by the temperature of the sand. Mm -hmm. So obviously, with global warming being a concern, then we're only going to get turtles of one species. I'm. I need to double check, but I think it's if it's the sand is warmer, then they're females, and if the sand is cooler, then they're males. Yeah. Okay. Um, but so one of the things, and this is the Kemp's Ridley Sea Turtle Program, is they're making it into a controversial topic uh, down in Texas because the Padre Island National Seashore is part of our charter when we acquired, when we, when they acquired the land back in the 1950s. Uh, it has to be allowed to be driven on by different vehicles. And so because of that, we go out and we take the eggs out of the sand, we put them in a temperature controlled incubator to make sure that there's exactly 50% females, 50% males, but it's very invasive for the turtle eggs because you remove them from their from their nest and you go and put them in a laboratory and temperature raise them, I guess. Um, but it does keep that 50-50 ratio. Oh, there we go. Bottom time. Sediment covered rock. Corley, are you in love with this geology already? <laughs> or are you over sediment covered rock? I think we're all over sediment covered <laughs> rock. <laughs> Ooh, hello, Tasmania. I feel like the answer to your question, what are we hoping to see but not expecting to see? A whale shark. <laughs> Absolutely. Whale shark. Whale shark, yes. Still manifesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is my own personal goal for this expedition? Well, right now I really want to finish up these two photo albums. That is that is my personal goal. Coralie, do you have a personal goal for this expedition? I need to finish my poster for conference. I'm frowning at these yeah. crusts. <laughs> <laughs> 
I got to do my very first poster presentation earlier this year. I it was a pain in the butt making it, but I loved it like the creative abilities of like I want to have a blue background and then I want my words to be this shade of blue. And then like I made um cuz I knew I wasn't going to have like that much of an ability to talk to everybody, so we made QR codes so people could watch YouTube videos of me presenting mm -hmm. and like a better, you know, description of the project. I felt like it was really successful. Surprised Nautilus doesn't have more QR codes like on Herc or something. So it's like every time they do a white balance, you take like a oh, QR you take code. A, yeah. Like you can learn about <laughs> the video engineer or something. So Nautilus, if you're listening, mm -hmm. Coralie's here for all of the innovative ideas. Mm -hmm. But I do, I think that would be a cool idea. Have you seen the new VR thing that Nautilus launched? No. It's really neat. You don't necessarily have to have a VR, but of course VR makes it so much better. But you take a tour around the boat. So it's it's mm. literally our boat and you walk through and you're like, oh, what oh, is this? Oh, I heard about that. Right. Yeah. But um, you Black can like- Black balance and white balance are, is complete. But so you can walk up to Hercules and you can click on like its robotic arm and it'll tell you like a little blurb about um, the manipulator arm versus the magnum arm. Alrighty guys, I am passing over to Chris. So for those that were listening uh, last night, we did have another dive that ended around 8 o'clock this morning, Hawaiian time. And we were diving on the same GEO, GEO unnamed GEO number 13. And there was a little top, a little hill on top of the GEO, uh, the GEO that we were exploring and using the Raman spectrometer, the laser bot. So in the time since this morning's dive till now, we have taken off the Raman spectrometer and now we're going to be exploring the eastern flank. And so this is a steep eastern flank uh, just below the flat summit of the guillot. And then once we get to the top of the guillot, we're going to start working our way south along the edge and see what we can find. Let me know when you're ready to take requests. Zoom fish, please. Stop uh, playing with the sea bias here for a minute. Mm -hmm. And Lynette, there's nothing magical about waypoint two. It's just uphill to the to the top, wherever we landed, gotcha. whatever the direction of traffic travel needs to be to make it happy. Okay. Let's try a zoom with our dry Zeus, see how that works. Serial number two. <laughs> like from inside Pacific serial number two? What's that? Just totally from inside Pacific, this is number two? <laughs> yeah. Nice. We have number one and number two. Any idea what kind of fish this is? Halosaur. <gasps> what is this magicalness? Thank you. Definitely going to want to screenshot this. Are they usually Time white like wind. this? Uh, I've you. seen the white morphs before, yeah. Okay. Um, normally, uh, no, normally they are grayer. Okay. I feel like I've never seen a white one. Not completely unusual. So what is a halosaur? I'm Google searching it right now. I Eel-shaped fish found only at 
deep oceans. Halosaur. <laughs> Sounds like a All right, that's good residual for us, from the you. dinosaurs. All right, there. There's going to be a little uh, thing on the right side of the camera there, Daryl. It was uh, <coughs> kind of a rush job. Yeah, when you zoom all the way out, though, you see the right side of the cowling there. It's Dwight, if you're listening, we greatly appreciate the sweet treats. Uh, bring your head to the right just a little bit, 10 degrees or so. So this is the same geo that we have been diving on the last two dives. This is our third dive. Um, this, si this time we are on the eastern flank, and we're just going to come up on the eastern flank um, up the table mount until we get to the... The basically where the weight, the wall breaks and turns into the um, the flat top, and then kind of work our way to the south. Um, right at that break is the plan. And here we have uh, a holothurian that's going to give us a little swimming display as we've disturbed it. So it's going to come off the seafloor and dance a little bit for us. The sea pig, or I'm not sure in the cucumbers what's exactly the com you know that's a the common name i'm not sure what it applies to and what it doesn't amongst the sea cucumbers so i got an education on this from one of our online viewers the last time and they were saying that no this cannot be called a sea yeah, pig she can move do a move to the south she should be able to do it in this weather they were also saying yep. that we cannot call this a headless so chicken monster may, i'll cheat a little for you how about um so this should be in the family Elpididae, and it's probably in the genus Amperema. Yeah. They're still so incredibly yeah. mesmerizing to watch. So there's some radical uphill to the to the west. Mm -hmm. There's some local uphill here. So yeah, let's try a 200. See what happens. Okay. Bridge nav. Can we move three zero meters uh, to zero zero, please? Thank you. Uh, zero point two. Thank you. Can't quite figure out which way is uphill. I'm getting returns both ways, so we're in a little local something. Well, Brian, about what temperature is it down here? It is exactly 1.9 right this second. 1.9 Celsius? Yep. Thank you. And it is definitely a lot colder than on the surface. And hello, Canada. Yes, there are no kelp forests down this deep or anywhere near where we are. But we have our own set of very unique geology, very unique um, biology down here. Where is it, Lynette? PC 2 or 3 or something? I can find it. But the SC. Thank you. Yeah. So, Brian, can you tell us why we're diving on this geo for the third time? Is there like a particular feature, or um, after this morning's dive, we just wanted to get a better baseline data? I wish I had a really well reasoned scientific justification for it, but I don't. Um, it's big. And so <laughs> we uh, wanted to get a better sense of the characterization of it because uh, it's so large, a uh, little bit of logistics of it had features on top of it um, that made it more interesting to dive 
uh, last night with the Raman spectrometer on board. Um, and we have a little bit of a weather window where it's a little bit calmer today than it has been to jump over here on the east side, which is a little bit more logistically difficult at times. Um, so we didn't want to transit very far. We wanted a quick turnaround and take advantage of the weather window while we had it to get a deeper east side dive. Um, so yeah, a little, just more or less it's big and the logistics worked out that it was, it was convenient to do three dives here. I think that's a really good answer. Thank you. So question online, do you ever um, intend to collect specimens that are not coral or sponges? And yes, Corley intends for us to collect many, many, many rocks. So yeah. many rocks. And we do also collect other biological samples as well. Yeah. We've gotten a couple jellyfish, mm -hmm. we've gotten one urchin, we've gotten a bunch of brittle stars, one benthic tenophore, a um, couple fossils. Yeah, so egg two, cases. two fossils. Yeah, egg, egg cases. cases. We also... Um, sea urchin. We also sometimes collect push cores, which can have... What? How long ago did you uh, call in that move? You know, microbes ago? in them. Yeah, I don't, but you I think write down the time when you call them. Generally, it no, push I don't cores, write down the time. more looking for macrofaunal and otolith samples. But of course it's rocks that are the real star of the show. Everyone has a different answer, but we, we wouldn't be here if it, for here, for so. <laughs> if it weren't for this uh, rock. Maybe we keep her moving and do the next one. Uh, bring your head to the right some for me. That looks like a big sea. St is that a rock or a sea star? Sea star. Sea star. Looks like a sea star. Hello, sea star. Silly biologist can't tell them to a, a sea <laughs> star on a rock. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, I was the only one in the control van that was was unsure about that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do the next one. Uh, two twenty-five. Two thirty. Okay. And you can keep her moving. It's going to be a long while to telegraph down to us here. This is a really cool sea star. Yeah, we Bridge haven't seen now. this sea star yet. Go ahead, Daryl. Can we move three zero meters to three zero zero point two knots? Two three zero. Thank you. Ooh. This looks like one of those flying squirrel suits. <sighs> that is beautiful. It's a weird one. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if I've ever seen this one before. Uh, oh, no, don't fall possibly. over. Possibly. Actually, please do fall over. Keep going, keep going, keep oh, going. Oh, no, no. I feel like we're bottom. being a bully to the sea star. No, we're just trying to see what's underneath. It's playing dead. <laughs> it's what munching on something. Oh. It has plant. a little oh. urchin. It's holding a small urchin. <gasps> oh. The spikies are really interesting. Yeah, those two feet. They're almost, they are yeah. so extended. So is the urchin still alive? Or are we going to watch him try to crawl away? Be like, thank you, you saved me. So I still think this is probably some type of um, terraster. Uh, it's probably a hymenaster. but it's a little bit different coloration, and I don't know how much the coloration varies on these, but I think this is some type of hymenaster, which is a still a type of slime star. Oh, a slime star. But this is not the ones I would say that look all that normal to me. All right, I think, uh, can, can we get a little bit closer view on the urchin? Yeah. Do we have any zoom left? Whoa. Full zoom. So it does not appear to be eating the urchin, at least not in this moment. 
So I don't really know what's going on here. It might be it might be attempting to eat it and it's having trouble negotiating <laughs> through its spines. Works. Or it might have just run over it by accident. I feel like it's showing off for us. Yeah. Oh. oh. <laughs> uh, I just oh. want to land all the way on it. <laughs> It just did a full somersault. It's and now big. it's a little cone. Yeah. And yeah. it's a big one. Has a sea star been known to eat sea urchins before? Off the top of my head, I don't know. Um, I will say sea stars are pretty voracious predators and are known for eating pretty much anything they can climb over. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me, but I can't definitely say that without doing a little research. All right, I think we've got all we need here, but that is a pretty cool find, and that's definitely yeah. different than I'm used to seeing. I'm used to, if it is a hymenaster, I'm used to them being a more royal purpley color. Okay. Oh. Right. Thank you, Google, for instantly popping this back up. Bridge now. Can we continue three zero meters to three zero, please? Thank you. So hymenaster literally translates to membrane star from Greek into English. Now I now I know what the what prefix hymen means. All right, not that I'm seeing any candidates, but let's be on the look for the angular, the proverbial angular cantaloupe. <laughs> This place is so sedimented, I don't know how likely that'll be. Or you could try and break off a piece here. Well, the catch with that is basalt doesn't generally break. Yeah. Or and, and if it does, we get a little tiny piece. And if it breaks, it's carbonate, and that doesn't really help the volcanologist. <laughs> So I love it. We have somebody online saying that the starfish was hugging his night toy like his little bedtime toy. Mm -hmm. And then another person was saying that we just made Chris Ma's entire week by with that find. I will be curious to see, hear what Chris says about the, uh, the relationship with the urchin. So does Chris Maul ever come on the science chat? Can we take a quick zo zoom coral, please? Or sponge, please? Sure. Ooh. Um, I, he has not joined this one. He does join Okeanos' chat fairly frequently. This is a nice sponge. It looks like yeah, a little too Yeah, it's quite pretty. All right, that's good, thanks. Okay. To the question online, have we ever seen a deep sea shark? Well, we would love to see a really big one, like a six gill, but we did see a lantern shark and we've seen several um, little dogfish, so like um, squalidae families. I would say we're due. Yeah, we're also due for a jumbo, uh, jumbo octopus, a whole bunch. Already. Yeah. Already. This expedition has been pretty devoid with the charismatic macrofauna. 
Yeah. Other than corals. We have not seen, no watch has seen a big shark or um, a benthic or cephalopod of any type. We've seen a few squids in the water column. Mm -hmm. We haven't come across any of the kind of classic deep sea octopods we see. Octopuses, octopoda. For those of you who actually have ever worked, curious about what is the plural of octopus, it's basically anything you want goes. <laughs> because it's an amalgamation of Greek and Latin. And so um, octopuses is perfectly acceptable. Octopi would be the Latin, but the rest of it's Greek. So, kind so of the take your pick. I think the correct form though is octopuses, and same with platypuses. It is, th yeah. If you go by the Greek rules, yes, it's octopuses. But since most Lat most scientific names and stuff come from Latin, um, I think it's actually octopodes is the like oh. truly correct version. But no one says that. I have all kinds of third graders and little ones. Tell me that yeah. all the time. Okay. I'm a little nervous about that return off to his left there, but see yeah. what happens. I love those sweet little questions. Two zero move. Mm. Did you know yeah. that the plural of all the octopus is an wait. octopi? No, let's uh, let's move west. You want straight west? I have a colleague at BU who has an entire like five minute okay. That's legitimate uphill, presentation, but he presents it in comic fashion. Yeah, about the, the bathymetry plurality um, of octopuses, is sort of and it's southwest. pretty hilarious. And I can't remember all the details, but he goes through all the different this etymologies of the word. Like the strongest returns are south. Oh, I see what's going on. No, you can let's try a two two five. Okay. Southwest. Sorry, I'm. A little slow on the uptake here. Bridge uh, nav. Bring your head to the left some more for me, if you're not already. Can we move three zero meters two two five, please? Thank you. So this is one of the deeper dives we've done so far. Um, you want to worry yeah. home the DVL? Just at um, 2,400 meters, 2,412 to be exact. Um, this is one of the three deepest dives we've done so far. I'm still hoping the weather will cooperate for another dive to get down to 3,000 meters or deeper at some point this week. Um, but the, the reason we didn't do that here is the bathymetry below here looked flat and completely mm -hmm. sedimented. And it was going to probably be super boring. <coughs> but I'm hoping one of the other deeper ridges north of here. Can we take a quick zoom on the anemone, please? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm hoping one of the deeper ridges will give us a shot at 3,000 meters because only two of the 32 dives that have been done in this area have gone deeper than where we are now at about 2,500. All right, that's good. Thanks. Okay. Thank you to our viewer who is sending in all the great links about sea urchins and starfish. So according to some of the links that they were sending in, uh, some sea starfish prefer eating urchins over anything else. Interesting. A lot of some of the fundamental understanding of communi community dynamics and biological systems were done on Oregon rocky intertidal zones. So there's a huge amount of kind of basic understanding of how nature works. Uh, exhibit similar emotions and almost like people in a way. So we had to really consider just how different things animals think. Mm -hmm. And if anything, that's creating more empathy for those animals as we are not only observing them and studying them, but also looking to protect them. And that's a big part of what ultra conservation does, is by preserving these vast open waters for 
uh, these animals that have called it home for millions of years. Oh, and another cool thing I learned is that, um, like whales, I think sperm whales and humpback whales, they have like their own language almost, and oh. they even have their own names. But it's like the click sounds that they make yeah. in the water, and they're using um, AI now to kind of go through all the different whale sounds and try and decipher whether they're like, like what they're talking about, and like if they form sentences or. Like they, it's very interesting because they've actually taken recordings from different parts of the world's oceans and found that there are different dialects and even of like whale clicks, and that's pretty interesting. Right. That they yeah. are that diverse. Yeah, it's really neat. So speaking of animal intelligence, do you guys ever feel like your dog outsmarts you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All the time. Um, we try to get him like this dog food where we try to mix it with like dry dog food and wet dog food just so he can like, you know, not have to eat dry food all the time. And he will literally only like we mix it up and everything and he would just like lick the wet food off of the dry food <laughs> and not eat the dry food still. Oh jeez. <laughs> <laughs> and then he hid under all my stuffed animals because I have like a million <laughs> and he hid under all of them and when I was calling his name like he was not coming out or anything and it wasn't until like he sneezed where I knew that he was under my stuffed animals <laughs> and I had a whole panic attack <laughs> thinking Aww. he was missing. That's so cute. <laughs> so yes, they are definitely, <laughs> they can outsmart us. My, my dog is like a diva. She, uh, <laughs> the older she gets, like the more finicky she gets to where like, you know, things like chips or whatever, even if it's flavored chips, mm -hmm. like she doesn't want nothing to do with it unless you put dip on it. <laughs> even, even if you put dip on a little corner, she'll just eat the corner and <laughs> leave the rest. Or like you give her bread or something and she'll just drop it like, what is this? There's nothing on this. There's nothing good on this, you know? Like, and you'll get her relate. all hyped up and be like, oh, here you go. And like toss it to her and she just drops it like, <laughs> go, what are you doing? I mean, it's ridiculous. But even flavored chips, I'm like, oh, barbecue or... You know, whatever she'll like. <laughs> no, there's no dip. It's a no go. <laughs> oh my God! Gosh, you just reminded me. Trained. <laughs> yeah. You just reminded me of how good chips and dip is gonna be. If you're sitting in a chair, our mini Snowser will just stare at you until you get up, and then she'll jump on the chair. <laughs> <laughs> Even if you're like, "Come on, Bella, you can do it," she'll just she'll just she Ooh. won't do it until you get up, so she can choose her position first. Pre-warmed mm -hmm. chair. That's why. <laughs> True. Um, my mom's been texting me this whole since I've gotten here on the expedition because she's like, um, my dog, he has no problem like jumping on the bed, you know, get in the bed with me and stuff. But for some reason, he never jumps on her bed. Like, <laughs> he waits for her to pick him up. <laughs> so she's been texting me like <laughs> this whole time, like, why does he not just jump up here? He does it for you, he won't for me. He waits for me to pick him up. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. <laughs>
I think that's the answer that she picks him mm -hmm. up. Yeah. <laughs> She's oh yeah. He is spoiled rotten. <laughs> he is so spoiled. The cat at home, he will only play with me this way, but um, whenever I come home, he has this like mouse plush toy that he likes and I'll act like, you know, the mouse is like moving so he can like catch it, but he'll catch it and then he'll start meowing, Aww. like trying to defend it from me. And I don't know why he only does this with me, but yeah, I, I sometimes I'm like, maybe he's too smart for his own good. And then other times I'm like, no, he's not. <laughs> he's really not. He knows how to uh, sit and give give a high five. Your cat? Yeah, that's impressive. They they can learn a lot actually. They're very um. They're, well, he's very food motivated, so it's very easy to train him. Yeah. <laughs> in that I, way. I feel cats are definitely smart enough. But I feel like most cats don't want to. They just don't care. Yeah. My cat has been trained to know exactly uh how to wake me up in the morning to <laughs> give him his wet food. Mm -hmm. If anything, he's training me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you ever hear the thing, like, people say uh, the difference between dogs and cats is, like, the cats see the attention that you're giving them and, and they figure, like, oh, wow, look at all this effort. I must be a god. <laughs> 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 yeah. Like, same effort by the dog is interpreted as, like, wow, look at all that effort. I, they must be god. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good. <laughs> so how does your cat wake you up exactly? He's deep in thought. <laughs> hmm? What's going on? <laughs> Sorry, I was looking she at a map. How does your cat wake you well, up? Generally, I think it's by torturing you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 yowling or climbing on your face or something. <laughs> yeah, he just like he eats up on my my upholstery on my bed. <laughs> he'll just come in. Ooh. He'll just sit there, sees I'm Shelly. asleep, and then he'll just like start calling at my bed. <laughs> and then he'll see I wake up, and then he'll like run, then look back and see if I'm coming up out of bed. And then if I don't move, then he'll just come back and do the same thing. <laughs> My cat has an automatic feeder, so it's like a it's like a thing like a tray that basically has two bowls and the and the lids come up at a certain timer. And it looks like it was it went through a blender because of how much she gnaws and paws at it. Yeah. Um and yeah, she does the same thing at night. She will if I don't close the door, she will paw at it and like essentially lift it up and like slam it on the floor to try and open it. She'll lick the, she'll lick my plastic blinds for like hours. Um, yeah, they know how to get what they want. Has she ever opened it? No. <laughs> she just doesn't learn that she can't <laughs> open it. She's just so, so determined. Do any of your guys' cats ever drool or have like weird yes. quirks? No. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> when I bring out the hot Cheetos, she gets a little watery. <laughs> God, my mom had a Himalayan Persian, and like if you oh. you just pet it, you just pet it, and it just literally is like a dog. It starts <laughs> draining, yeah. and, and it always would. It loved cotton candy, and you oh. could not leave bread, a loaf of bread, or pitchers out because it would lick all the film off the pitchers. <laughs> But it would tear into her, like, you'd wake up and the bread would be, like, the other side of the house just in shambles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, my kitties are definitely carb hounds. Like, croissants are not safe around them. <laughs> And for those of you who are wondering if we have any pets on board the Nautilus, we do not. <laughs> Sadly. Unless you count the... Uh, birds that have been hitching a ride mm -hmm. this whole time. <laughs> the what boobies. about Francisco? Uh, Had him for a little while, too. I think he's oh, long yeah. gone. But who knows? We named one of the oceanic white tip sharks that was hanging out. Yeah, his name's Francisco, aka Frank. <laughs> <laughs> there were three um, yesterday. Or wait. 
the day before. Yeah. Oh my gosh, they had spinach and artichoke dip towards the beginning. I miss it. So what are y'all thinking the ice cream flavors are gonna be today? Mm. I hope it's coffee again, that was good. It was good, but that had me like, oh, <laughs> like <laughs> I could not go to sleep. <laughs> I doubt it will be the same flavor. I'm I'm gonna bet that one flavor is gonna be chocolate. Pineapple would be good. They usually oh, have strawberry. I'm gonna ooh, ooh strawberry. Sorbet. We had a strawberry picture. cheesecake though. Did they have that last time? A couple uh, times ago. The first time. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. But another sorbet would be amazing. Well, they've been doing sherbet, or but sorbet would be yes. nice someday. I feel like strawberry ice cream is very different from strawberry cheesecake. Though. It is, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how they decide what ice cream flavors to bring on. <laughs> I really wanted to try that vanilla bean, but it was all gone by the time <laughs> I got to ice cream. <laughs> yeah, that was like half gone when it, when they opened it. So I don't know what was going on back there, <laughs> or if it was just from a previous something else. Hmm. Somebody's been sneaking into the freezer. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like vanilla is not usually a popular flavor, though. Mm. I think it is. I don't so know. If you're basic like me, you're going to go for vanilla. <laughs> <laughs> and there was vanilla beam at that. I like vanilla beam. That's true. How much longer? Um. <laughs> <laughs> About 40 How much minutes. Long, so. How much longer till ice cream, I meant? No, yeah. <laughs> I'm oh. kidding. <laughs> no, till the bottom. 40 37 minutes. years. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're in for the long haul. So we will finish our watch before we get to the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Oh, well. I'm watching the lounge. Or come back for dinner relief. Yep. Have yep. you guys all been doing that? Yep. Mm -hmm. I'm getting a pass this time. I haven't done it once. Yeah, me too. What? Dan doesn't eat. Adam comes up. <laughs> what? <laughs> I must say, um, I do it here and there. Chris doesn't typically, sometimes he doesn't eat. Mm. What? Yeah. Oh my god. No, I, d I do it every time. Yeah. Which is kind of sad because I like to enjoy my meal, but I think I'm just going to come up straight at five. That's what I do. Because um, yeah. at first, I did oh forget, yeah, that's and I do. wouldn't come up. Yeah, get um, them down there and back up. But there also, and then eat in peace. But yeah. also, when it like when it was like avocado night, you know, that's where it's hard. You don't want to miss out. Yeah. <laughs> but you also don't want to miss the ice cream. I know, but <laughs> you know, hey, I'm gonna assume there will be ice cream left for me. That is why I make a plate and I squirrel it away, <laughs> and they will like put ice cream in bag for you if you make a little bowl. Oh, yeah. Hand it to them, yeah, they'll put it in the freezer and back. I'll just Aww. take my chances. Worst case scenario, no ice cream. Uh, that's, that's pretty devastating. bad. That's pretty bad, that's though. Devastating. <laughs> um, I think I'm just going to eat my ice cream first, then my dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Switch it up. <laughs> Switch it up. <laughs> I mean, who made the rule that you eat dinner before dessert? Right. I don't know. Who made a lot of society's rules? Is the question. I mean, who made dessert for breakfast? Like French toast pancakes? Is yeah, that's really oh, atrocious. Yeah. I'm sorry. American breakfasts hurt me. Well, I'm sorry you don't like fun. <laughs> but yeah. that's right. actually really delicious. Because French toast is a go. <laughs> Processed <laughs> sugar straight in the morning. Love oh, yes. It. I don't drink delicious. coffee, so i got to have something. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about sugar in the morning, it just like triggered the thought of 